All right, let's start week three. Here we go, any minute now. We'll just edit this part out. Normally, <clears throat> right now, is when I would start the introduction of the Simpson meter. And we would go over how to read it and what all of these settings are. You're probably thinking, well, wait, a little bit late in the uh, semester. I mean, most of you have already finished project, whatever, three. But normally, students don't get that far. They're still struggling with this thing going, huh? I don't get it. But uh, you guys, uh, now that I've revamped 309, you've already had it. You've already had the quiz. You've already had the test. So we can move on and get to some other stuff and go a little bit slower through that stuff. How's that sound? Good. <clears throat> Good. But we <clears throat> still have that quiz on this one. So what we're going to talk about, though, is meters and how they work. And it's not really so much that I care how you, that you know how the insides of an analog meter work, because I expect that every one of you, when you get out of here, you'll never look at another analog meter again unless you end up teaching here. Uh, other than that, you're just going to get a digital one and you're not going to care. So, but the whole point of what we're going to talk about is that, um, number one, you're required to learn the information. But what it does is it reinforces and teaches you about Ohm's Law because we're going to use Ohm's Law in some different ways, just kind of come at it, but you should see it go, that's just Ohm's Law, it's just all it is. Series circuits, parallel circuits, series parallel circuits, nothing new, just another way of looking at it to reinforce that learning. And two, uh, you know, we are in a transition phase right now, which is really interesting to watch, where everybody's going from what they would call steam gauges, they don't operate off steam, but round analog gauges to flat screen digital gauges. And uh, that's, that's the wave of the future. But currently, there are still a lot of analog meters out there. And you should be able to understand that. If somebody brings in uh, an aircraft and says, hey, I, my ammeter is doing this thing on the instrument panel, or the voltmeter is doing this thing on the instrument panel, you should know how to diagnose that rather than saying, I really don't know, man. That's, you know, uh, sucks for you. Sounds like a you problem. Uh, you're the one to fix it. Right now, I did take my aircraft and I went from the analog gauges where I had, you know, an analog ammeter and, and and now have a flat screen that has a digital ammeter. But guess what? It's still I had to do wire it in the same way. And so it's now just a digital display. But behind it is still the same theory. It's still um, working the same way. It's, it uses a shunt to check a voltage drop to display an amperage. And so that's something that you should all be able to understand here pretty soon. So, moving on, we will talk about meters. Yeah, let's we'll start with the voltmeter. Voltmeter. Uh, what does that indicate? All right. Indicates voltage, right? Never assume anybody knows anything. <clears throat> Let's talk about the movements. Now, if you ever spend any time in a, in a you know, hospital or something like that, they may ask you about your movement. Uh, this is not that. This is something a little different than that. Is there anybody who does not get that? So. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, how's Elijah? Oh, there you are. You're normally right back there. No, uh, this is where that uh, Minton guy was. It's a little here. Mike, yeah, yeah, he had to. All right. I, didn't. I was sitting over there, but. Okay, you moved around. I was worried about you. So. Oh. Obviously, you're fine. You're here. <laughs> good enough. There's my wife and I say, better than good. I'm good enough. <laughs> All right. Uh, movements. All right, so we're going to talk about well, the movement is what makes the meter, the needle, if you will, move. So we have a couple of them. One of them was the galvanometer, G-A-L-V-A-N-O. 
M E T E R. This was the first type of movement that uh, that was used. So I think I have a picture. There we go. Simple that meter. Sometimes I can say it correctly. Sometimes I can't. Galvanometer. Anyway, if you can look at it, what it consists of is a loop of wire. And <clears throat> that loop of wire has positive and negative, and a little, if you will, a compass in the middle. So it's just got a north-seeking north end of this magnet and a south-seeking end of the little um, lodestone, if you will. It's like a compass. And the reason why it works is because when you put current through a wire, it's going to create a magnetic field about it. And when you loop that wire, you're going to create an electromagnet, which is all that is. So they've created an electromagnet, and they put this little compass inside of it. On um, It should have like a little spring on it that wants to hold it just kind of at zero. And the more current that goes through it, the more it's going to swing and want to line up. So you can see how you could do something like that to create a, a crude or rudimentary um, voltmeter, is what we're talking about, ammeter as well. So, all right, <clears throat> it's a device. device. I'm going to say it's a device that reacts to minute electromagnetic influences caused within itself by the flow of small amount of current. So a device that reacts reacts to minute electromagnetic Now this whole idea of electromagnets that's we're going to start talking more and more and more about them so that's something you want to kind of keep in your head right there what is an electromagnet it's simply coils of wire with current going through it. It creates an, a magnet using electrons, electric, electricity. Uh, influences caused within, caused within itself by the flow of a small amount of current by the flow of a small amount of current. Very simple galvanometer is just a magnetized needle suspended in a coil of wire. So very simple. Just a magnetized needle, just a magnetized <coughs> needle suspended in a coil of wire. And as I said, when current flows through the wire, when current flows through the wire, through the wire, or the coil of wire, a magnetic field is produced. is produced and the needle aligns with the field and the needle aligns itself with the field the field being the electromagnetic field that is created by the wire Now, as much as possible, I like to draw the picture for you because then you can draw along. But 
All attempts at making this in a drawing have failed. So now you have the picture. Next, we're going to talk about the D'Arsonval or Weston meter. So this is a improvement upon what we had before. Kind of the next evolution, if you will. And it's really one of the most common types. And so now you can start to see where it makes more sense, where we have the needle and the numbers that you're seeing. But, you know, what goes on behind that? Well, it's the same theory, which is why we started with the simple one. We're just going to move to this one. It's a little bit more um, complex, but not much at all. So we can see we have a small wire is going to come in here, and we're going to run through here. So what are we creating here as we run the wire through here and run some current through it? That's a magnetic field. A magnetic field, right? And then we have a north and south pole permanent magnet. So that being the difference, we have an electromagnet, which if there's no current, it's off, no electricity, no magnetic field, versus a permanent one, which is a horseshoe magnet here. And it is always on because it is a permanent magnet. So what happens is you can see at zero, there's a spring in here that's going to hold it to zero. So that's going to rest right there at zero because a little spring. And then as we put electricity through here, this becomes a north end of the magnet right here, and this is the south. And opposites will attract. attract. Opposites attract, same repels. Okay, so we have the north next to the north, south next to the south, south next to the south. And the more current that flows through here, the stronger the north and the south are going to become. And the stronger they become, the more they can fight this spring, and the more they will rotate over. Now, this scale right here you can see is very linear, but what is it about your scale that you noticed, especially on resistance? Uh, it's it is really bunched up together, like, you know, yeah, 1,000 infinity or just, you know, that, as where 0 to 1,000 over here is, you know, forever. So um, they're not necessarily linear, and you can kind of see why maybe that wouldn't be in something like this, because um, as it north gets further uh, repel, well, this one is linear, so we could say, oh, the north is going to start becoming attracted to the south and south to the north. So anyway, but that's the way that one works there. <clears throat> so that is the what? Do you remember the name? I said changed it. D-R-S-O-N. Yeah. D-R-S-O-N. D-A-R-S-O-N-V-A-L. D-R-S-O-N-V-A-L. Meter. Named after? Dr. Albert Meter. It's always got to be Albert or Weston. Weston meter. Uh, that is the most common type. Most common. Employs a moving coil and permanent magnet. Employs a moving magnet. Sorry, I don't want to say magnet. Moving coil, that's much better. Moving coil and permanent magnet. So it has an indicating needle, indicating needle is attached to the movable coil. As current flows through the coil, the north end of the coil is repelled by the north of the permanent magnet and attracted to the south of the magnet. So as current flows, through, oops. through the coil, the north end, end of coil is repelled by 
by the north of the permanent magnet. And attracted to, attracted to the south of magnet. The more the current flows, the stronger the coil and the more needle deflection you get. So the more, the more current flows, uh, the stronger the coil. stronger the coil and the more the needle deflects. Alright, so how much current does it take to make the needle go full deflection? Depends on the scale. Depends on the scale. Very good. So it depends on the scale. Also depends on the spring. And most importantly, how many turns you put in the coil. So the more turns you have, the stronger the magnetic coil is. If you just put one turn, not so strong. Put a whole bunch of them, very strong. <laughs> So let's see, the amount of current required to um, turn the needle, to turn the needle will depend on the magnet strength and number of turns uh, in the coil. <clears throat> so you can imagine if you were going to build a meter and I use the phrase, what was that, that book? It's a good book. Flight of the Phoenix. Did I mention that one yet? Mm -hmm. So I always talk about the Flight of the Phoenix scenario. I mean, if you're into reading books, I, I thought it was a, a, a decent book. It's a very old book. You guys read it? Watch the movie. Oh, I don't know where the movie. Anyway, so the, this scenario is, what is it, World War II? It had to be World War II. These guys crash in the Sahara Desert, you know, of Africa, in this aircraft, and helpless and they have to rebuild this aircraft and fly it out and so they basically take pieces and parts off of it and build a plane with what's left over so <clears throat> to talk about the flight of the phoenix scenario scenario it's kind of like you're stranded out somewhere and you just got to do what you got to do to survive so mm -hmm. you know it's uh, that scenario and you've got to make a meter well you could you know find a permanent magnet you got to you know find a little box to house a needle in you build this whole thing up and then you think well you know, how much uh, current would it take to make the needle move? Well, you know, if we talk about our Simpson meter, you have up to 10 amps, as much as 10 amps, all the way down to, uh, I think, microamps, right? Is there a microamp setting on there that we haven't used? All right, microamps. So how, how does that one needle do all of that? Well, you just kind of think it, plan it out, and you go, well, okay, we've got to make it work on the low end all by itself, and then every time we switch to a bigger setting, we'll just add a bigger resistor and just resist some of the current going through it, so we use the same meter. That's kind of the same thing, because you can't keep rebuilding a meter. Um, all right, <clears throat> so. Um, problem, only suitable, only suitable for measuring, measuring what? DC, why? Okay, very good. It's right along what I'm thinking. All right, so we're, we're, we're really only talked about 
DC so far in this class, direct current, which is a battery, which is from negative to positive. It's linear and it goes one way. And if we were to, we're to start talking about oscilloscope pictures, and an oscilloscope is uh, a television version of uh, a voltmeter. It gives you a visual representation of what you're looking at. So instead of seeing a needle move to 10, you would see a line on a screen rise up to the 10. You just see a line going like this because it's DC. But if we have AC and you look at it over time, so it's always time, so you have how many seconds you look at it, and battery just goes like that for you know a minute, 10 minutes, a year, whatever. That's what a battery does. But if we look at alternating current, AC, it will go positive, then negative, then positive, then negative. So it's constantly switching back and forth for, you know, I'll say for a second, but it's what, one 360 at the second, it goes one way, then it goes the other. So if we were trying to measure AC with this, first the AC will slow it way down, would come in one way, and as it comes in and it goes through the magnet, there's a, and I won't get into these ever because you don't need to know it, it's very confusing. There's right hand rule of thumb and left hand rule of thumbs with all kinds of different things. We'll do with generators. But basically it's, it talks about um, movement and which way the current flows is which way it's gonna give you your magnetic field. So this north-south version is pretty much set up assuming that one side, and I don't know which side it is, is positive and the other side is negative. And so if you do that, we say this over here, let me go back to the pen, and I'm just saying this for instance, that's positive and this is negative, well then that would give you a north. But if I reversed it and I said, well this is negative and this is positive, then this would make this a south and this would make this a north. You see what I'm saying? When you reverse the current flow, you reverse which way the magnetic field goes inside an electromagnet. So you're kind of like instantaneously, really quickly, just reversing the polarity. So if you had AC and a permanent magnet, one second it's going to be North. working, and the next second it's not. And mm. Not seconds, but so what is it going to do? It's just going to vibrate. Yeah. So I don't want to do anything, because by the time it starts to move, it's telling it to go the other way. So this would never work with DC, because you have a permanent magnet with an internal magnet that is changing polarity nonstop. So you can make a little vibrator out of it, if that's what you're into. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, if you got back pain or something like that. Uh, okay. <laughs> What's that? Like quick save. Quick save? Why? Yeah. <laughs> Is there some other function you would use a vibrator for? <laughs> Well, I mean, there's the tool, the vibro thing, and you write on stuff. Come on, guys. You may have to explain something after class. I don't know. Uh, AC would continuously reverse and vibrate. I don't know which one to come first, but vibrate. So if we want to talk about something that has a DC or AC meter movement, we would have to look at something a little bit different. <clears throat> so in this one, in AC, in AC, we'll just bring this point up here, the voltage and current. and current reverse. Which again, we're going to talk about that in great detail coming up, but the more we can bring it up now and the more you kind of get used to it, you have to remember that, you know, with our simple DC circuits, we measured current and we measured voltage. Well, an AC circuit, not only does the current literally go back and forth, but so does the voltage. So the voltage pushes and the current goes this way, then the voltage changes and then the current changes. And believe it or not, they don't necessarily happen simultaneously. Hmm. They should, and you want them to, but they don't always. We'll talk about that later, how uh, coils and capacitors can actually have an effect on, on how they work. <clears throat> I'll just tell you now. So 
<laughs> ah, you're not held responsible for it now, but when you add a coil to a, an AC circuit, a coil has properties that fight it, what's coming through. Um, we refer to it as Eli the Iceman. So coils are L so for inductors. So that means the uh, E voltage is first, and so the current lags. So when the current comes through a coil, it tries to stop the current from coming through. But yet the voltage is fine. So the voltage starts to get ahead of it. And so the voltage goes, and then the current, and then the voltage starts going the other way, and then the current then has to turn around, and it starts following. So if you look at it in a graph, you would see the voltage doing one thing, and the current should be right there, lockstep with it. It isn't. The voltage goes, and it starts coming down. Then the, the current will go, and so the two start getting out of sync. You start getting out of sync, you start losing power because the two aren't in sync. And so my father-in-law, he was an electrician for SMUD. He worked out at Rancho Seco, the nuclear power plant. And so he was telling me that, okay, so I just told you coils screw things up, right? So let's think, what do we have that would be a coil that we use electricity-wise? Uh, everything. A fan, there's a fan in there, it's a coil. Um, there's no coils in the, the lights, but you know, almost everything, every motor we have is a coil. So every time a motor comes online, it starts screwing with the, the current coming out of, out of SMUD and PG&E. So to correct it, you have capacitors, which do the absolute opposite of a coil. So they have these, you told me, these giant like, warehouse rooms with coils. And they'll watch it when the phase, the electricity starts to get out of phase, then they'll bring on a coil, start adding coils, bring it right back in. So. Capacitors, that's what I meant, capacitors. Start with a C, I was so close. <laughs> we got you. Got me? More gin, I'll be fine. All right, uh, current rim, the vibrate. Okay, we did that. Um, so reverse, if a DC meter, if a DC meter is used, the needle will be vibrate or be inaccurate. If a DC meter, oops, I said that, is used, um, the needle will vibrate. and or <clears throat> be inaccurate. So we can have two different types of AC-DC analog. So two types, two types of analog movements. And this will work AC or DC. <clears throat> so one is usable on lower frequencies. Uh, 15 to 1000 Hertz. Hertz is cycles per second. And that is the dynamometer. Not like the thing you put the car on and see how much horsepower it has, but this thing. So I think, let me see that picture of that. There we go. So what's different about this one? Guys are with me, right? Yes. What's different? Uh, like inner coil, and then the one that's loosely. So what's it missing? The current that, the, that the that the last one had. Stationary. Stationary permanent magnet. So this has an electromagnet. Well, why is that going to be any better? Well, as current starts to flow one way through here, it is going. To, it's going to come through here. And note that it also goes through the, the coil here that moves and out. So we can do this way. There we go, pan, 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 pan. So if this is the positive and this is the negative, then we could say that this would be the north and this would be the south. And let me see. 
this makes it kind of hard the way they drew it because you want it to repel and go the right way but we'd have to say this is north and that's south how, how would that work so this will attract <clears throat> it down that way does that make sense does that work mm -hmm. all right so but in this case it would only get to like kind of level here and then be done but you just work with me on that so that's how it would work but if we changed it around and said well we're reading ac and the ac is going to swap and in a second that's going to be a negative and this will be a positive then that would make this the south and then make this the north and it would make this the south and make that the north and then it would go that way just like it did before so you're switching the polarity of the magnets constantly so it keeps bringing the meter and the meter doesn't seem to care all that much but then you got to think about that you got to say hmm would it really work well hmm. because if you think about the electricity it peaks then it's off then it peaks then it's off then it peaks and it's off and it peaks and it's off so if we truly had say 10 of whatever we're measuring here 10 amps 10 volts and you'll see why that works either way so we had 10 and that's really what we were measuring would it actually work and go to 10 or would that period of off on off on actually cause some sort of problems with this because if you think about it if you're driving down the road and you're in your your gas pedal throttle at a certain exact point you can go 60 miles an hour and you went 60 then off and 60 then off and 60 then off would you still be going 60. go slower how much slower well if you care it'd be about 7.707 times slower so we're going to get more into that but there is a function in that so it doesn't actually read correctly so if we looked at an oscilloscope and we saw it peak out and this peak right here is 10 and then it comes back down here and goes back up and this right here is zero and it got to well that'd be positive 10 and this would be negative 10 and then back up and we're measuring that it would not in fact say 10 because you're actually averaging these out well you're not really averaging it's called root mean squared because if you average the positive 10 and a negative 10 what would the average be zero zero i don't have zero so well they don't cancel each other out they just add up differently so that is called RMS voltage, RMS, root mean squared, which is really you square everything, then take the square root of it and then get the average. Yeah. So does that mean that the average you get there is 7.07? .07? What's that? Does that mean that the average you get for that? Yep, 707. Off track a little bit. That's fine. We're going to be dealing with that later. All right, two types, the, that one right there. So he uses electromagnet instead of permanent. needle is connected in now before I write this sentence let's figure this out here how is this connected is it parallel or series or yeah strictly parallel so you have one point so it's there and there so whatever's flowing in has to go through both of them Could we connect it in parallel in series and get the same thing? I would say no, but I haven't figured out why. You actually could, because as long as you get the voltage to flow through the whole thing, and so it's got to be in series or it's going to be connected in. So I'll put either series or parallel. Here's a nice thing. Indicating needle, I -D -I -C -A -T -I -A, the indicating needle 
will always move the same direction regardless of polarity because it's made to go both ways. Indicating needle will always move in same direction regardless of polarity because polarity of both needle and coil, polarity of both needle and coil change together. Okay, another type we have is the iron vein. Which ironically was the name of my band. Mm. It wasn't, but that would be kind of a, that would be yeah. cool. <laughs> have to be hard rock, of course, but yeah. Did you travel That's with a, Iron Maiden? I no. did not. No. Yeah. I heard they were pretty awesome in the uh, black performance. <laughs> Oops, iron vein. Let's see. I'm sure we got a picture of an iron vein. There we go, iron vein. So this time we have a piece of iron right there, <coughs> ferromagnetic, which means it is attracted to magnetism. And we run a magnet through here, put a little spring on there. And so the more current we get through here, the more we're going to make an electromagnet. The stronger the electromagnet, the more it's going to pull that vein inside, overcoming the spring tension. And there we go. There we go. Needle is attached to an iron vein. Needle is attached to an iron vein. As current flows through the solenoid, the iron vein is attracted and registers voltage. So as is current. current flows through the solenoid. The iron vein is attracted and registers voltage. And the electromagnetic forces forces are counterbalanced by a spring. If it wasn't for the spring, when you activated the solenoid, it would just pull that iron vein all the way into it. Clunk. And lastly, why it's D, I don't know, the rectifier type. There we go, rectifier type. All right, so by now, you, most of you have had a little bit of experience working with the LED, light emitting diode, and the diode in your series series pro project? Mm -hmm. All right. So I'll try and lighten up a little bit here. All right. Thank you, you're good, you're good. All right, now, I'm losing Patrick, he's, he's fading on me. <laughs> so okay, so we talked about AC, here's AC, right? Positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. And you have found out, most of you, 
that your diode or LED will only work going one way because a diode is a check valve and a check valve is something in hydraulics that is a little flapper valve and a little flapper valve and so it'll work and let fluid go one way but if fluid tries to go back the other way it slams shut the valve and fluid can't go the other way so diode is a little check valve it only works one way and as the drawing that I can't delete right here shows I like to think about diodes written back before they change the theory. So if you think about a diode, that they, they invented it and made the symbol, before they switch to electron theory flow, it makes more sense because it's got a triangle that tends to point in the direction of current flow, which would be from positive to negative. And the little negative goes on the negative side. But you can say current goes that way and the negative turns it on if you want. But um, current, this will allow it to work if it's positive here and negative there. Whichever, whichever way the current's going to flow um, in your head, this is on or forward bias. Yeah, I don't write that. Okay, and this is on or forward bias. Forward bias when this is positive and this is negative. All right, <clears throat> so looking at uh, a rectifier is what this is, a full wave rectifier. That means, a full wave means that it's gonna take this wave of AC and a full wave will make it look like this. That's full wave. A half wave rectifier would delete everything below it and so it would look like this. That would be half wave rectification. So these are full wave rectifiers. All right, so if we kind of look at how it goes, um, thankfully there's the, the little lines here. And this is a little trickier than what you might think. Uh, it's not terrible. All right, so here we have the AC source. Right now they're saying that this is the negative and this is the positive, okay? So we'll use uh, negative to positive flow theory since that's how they drew the arrows. So current's going to flow up to this way and get to this junction. Now, since we're using the electron theory flow, that means that the line, the little negative line, turns it on. So can it go down? No. Nope, because it's, but can it go up? Yes. yes, because the little negative turns it on. So negative turns it on, it comes to this point. So again, uh, it's still negative, so will this, can it go this way? No. 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 Okay, you're, you're just watching the arrows there. Okay, so it comes this way, it goes through the load, comes back this way, uh, it goes through here. Now it's this point, and holy crap, now what? Well, you got two negatives. So now how are you going to figure this out? Well, this becomes the theory of the more negative and the less negative. So this is more negative this way, and that's why it's going to go that way. If you compare the two here, then um, this is more negative this way, and this becomes the positive, if you think about it, because this was up here, the negative side. We started negative. We went through the load, so guess what we are now? We're positive. We're positive. Well, if it's positive, then why did it go this way? Well, because this is more positive than this. So it worked its way up through here and then down. I know that's kind of a hard one to, to grasp, especially just hitting it quite that fast. But it, it is the concept of which is more negative, which is more positive. So, so you can see that while it's negative, positive, it, f it was flowing okay. Now we reverse it, positive, negative, and it just does the opposite. So it goes this way, and so it's going to come down through here, through the load. Uh, I go backwards, sorry. I just screwed it up. Yeah, all I gotta do is follow the arrows. I mean, it's not that hard. It's like, you know, first grade stuff here. It's gotta do it. So, all right. Up, yeah, because it goes there. And it goes to that point. Now where? Follow the arrows. It's negative. So, negative goes up, comes to here. All right, so it doesn't go that way, so it's going to go this way, down through, over. It gets to this point. Which one is more, now we're positive. Which one is actually um, positive in respect to the other side? Well, it would be going this way and then down, down, and down. When you say more positive or more negative, is that because of the diode, how it's 
designed or is it just? No. So think back to your series circuit. Mm -hmm. So if we had a simple series circuit, right, and we put, uh, we'll make the battery here, ground, ground. Okay, now I want to measure R1 right here. What's the positive side? Is it point A or point B? Uh, point A. Point A is positive? Yeah. Why don't you be sure? Point A is positive. Yes. So I'm going to put the red lead here. And, and B is going to be? Negative. Negative. So I'm going to put the, the black one here? Yes. Okay. Sure about this? Yes. Okay. Now let's take a look at this one. All right. We'll make this. We still have B, A, B. This would be C. Okay. Which one is the positive? So B and C. Which one? I got, I've only got one red probe on my voltmeter. Where am I going to put it? A, B, or C to measure the voltage drop on this R2? Where am I going to put the red probe? Uh, He's like, I'm not asking a question. You're going to pick on me. No, that's cool. B. B. What do you think? I'll go with the class. B. All right. So we're going to put the red probe this time on B. Now, it's, and wh where's the black one go? C. C. Well, wait a minute here. I thought B was the negative. Now you tell me it's the positive. So can you see sometimes B is the negative and sometimes B is the positive. So B is negative in respect to A. But A, but B is positive in respect to C. Visual. Black and the red. Correct? Yes. A is positive, B is a negative. Right. But over here, B is positive, now C is negative. So this is positive and it's negative. Positive. See, because it's it's in not relation. an absolute. Right. B is positive in respect to C, but it's negative in respect to A. It's the same thing with these diodes. One is positive with respect to one side, negative when you come back around. Okay. It's like whatever's closest to the positive or negative terminal. Kind of like that, yeah. See? Alright. All right. All right. So you can see that no matter which way the current is flowing, these little gates will only allow it to flow one way. And that one way is always flowing this way through that load all the time. So we've taken something that's back and forth, back and forth, and ran it through four little diodes. Now it always goes this way. So that's the rectifier type. Let me see. So it uses a rectifier. Rectifier to send current through the meter. in one direction. Not the band, no, so put your hand yeah. down. Yeah. What's the uh, use of the resistor in the rectifier? You always have to have a load. Okay. So that could have been a motor or a light or a... Oh, it's just like a placeholder it's for just, the load. It's just a placeholder for the load. Ah, oh, I didn't think I was gonna get into this, but I did, all right. The meter reads RMS, which you already know what that means. Root mean square. Root mean square. Root mean square, which is 0 .707, 0 0.707 times peak.
times the peak voltage. You're only going to be able to see peak voltage on an oscilloscope because an oscilloscope, again, is a visual representation of what you're looking at. And you'll see the peak go all the way up and you see it all the way down. And it's, it's an actual. So you measure from the zero up to that peak and you can see exactly how many volts. But then you take your Simpson meter and you put it on there and you're like, oh man, it's not accurate. It's, you know, like only 0.7 times what the, all oh, that's supposed to be. So the meter, your, your volt meter is going to read root mean square and your oscilloscope is going to read actual. And that brings us to a break time. Ready?